Um, I guess one should begin at the beginning, um, which is childhood and youth. I grew up in a place called Rocky River, Ohio, that no one has ever heard of. It's a suburb of Cleveland, west of Cleveland, not Shaker Heights, which is east. Um, a very kind of monochromatic, everybody all pretty much the same. Um, I remember very little about my childhood, actually. It was fundamentally boring. Um, I was an only child without an extended family to speak of, so um, started school with very little socialization to people, I guess. Um, my father was, let's see, the, ba the background was dad was German and Irish, son of a railroad engineer. Somewhere I have his great-grandfather's immigration papers to the U.S. Um, mother was, my mother was um, of Scots and German descent, so not Scottish-Irish, Scottish -Irish, but some of each, um, and a lot of German, very little noise made about the German background after two world wars. I was born in 1943 in the middle of one. My father was too young for the first world war and too old for the second one. So it really had no valence <coughs> for me growing up at all. Uh, I had one friend who had a brother that fought in the Korean War and I thought that was kind of weird, but he made it home. So it was just the outside world did not impinge on anything. One of my strongest memories of childhood is figuring that I would never be able to learn how to read. It seemed like some kind of miracle that people could do that. And then I went to school and learned how to read, and um, that was the beginning of something else. My next aspiration was to read every book in the small local public library. When I was 11, I had to get them to I had to get my mother to approve an adult library card because they looked at it and I really had read everything in the children's section and a great deal of, of the adult section, but they finally noticed that I wasn't supposed to take those books out. And then not very long after that, I discovered the Cleveland Public Library and again readjusted my aspirations because one cannot read every book. Um, there is an, an index of selectivity, I suppose. It ran to, I think, historical fiction as, as the most obvious choice, I suppose, uh, which may not have been accurate, but it did give me, I think, a very anthropological sense of suspending judgment and thinking from within the kinds of things one reads. So that was kind of neat. Um, I wasn't very good at being a teenager, either. Um, someone who reads books in a Midwestern public high school um, and isn't very good at talking to people is not a successful um, teenager. Um, that didn't go well at all, I guess we should say. So my ambition for a lot of that stretch was to go somewhere else for college, which given that I had no brothers and was an only child, my father thought was a good idea. He did once say it would be good to have a college degree because if I ever had to support myself, I could, were I widowed or divorced or something. And I have supported myself, um, <coughs> have been the major support of my family for all of their growing up. Um, let's see, what else? That's perhaps enough. Well, I did get involved in citywide scouting in my high school years. 
that was much nicer because people didn't know anything about me and I didn't get this egghead kind of reputation so I could kind of hang out with people. And some of those people were a tad more what we would now call diverse than the ones I went to school with who really were all of a mold. So the college I chose to to go to, my first choice, was Bryn Mawr. Um, I was pretty sure it was a good idea to go to a woman's college because I didn't want to have to deal with this, she's weird, she reads books, kind of response, if possible. And it was very small. It was a good choice. It was a wonderful place for a nerd to grow up. Every now and then I come across the pictures of the freshman class at Bryn Mawr, and they were a hopeless bunch of oh my goodness. And by the time we graduated, most of them had become much more interesting and, and um, confident people, I guess. Bryn Mawr in those days had a faculty that was 50% women, which was unheard of anywhere else. Um, so you had role models in your discipline um, and in general for, for the life of the mind. Um, the, the other thing that my dad thought was wonderful was that they had a very high rate of people who went on to graduate school and professional school, higher than any other women's college in North America at the time, and higher than the women's half of Harvard and, and Columbia and so on. So it really was a very good place for people who wanted to talk about ideas. It was also because it was so small and dormitory based, you got a very good chance to talk to people who did other things. So there were sort of set of adjoining rooms. My roommates were majoring in chemistry, art history, and economics, which is a, a fairly substantial spread. And I spent a lot of time talking to them. So there were a lot of ways in which you, you had access to things beyond what you were yourself studying. And I think my, my habit of thinking across disciplines probably came from, from that. Uh, my first beginning of first year, I wandered into the, to a German class thinking that that would please my father. There were five people in the German class and the other four already spoke German. So, my next stop was the dean's office saying, what else can I take? Um, so what else turned out to be anthropology? Good decision, as it turned out. Um, that worked out very well indeed. They also made us take first year English for people who didn't want to study English, and I hated that. So the anthropology was much more fun. Anthropology was taught, the first year course was taught by Frederica de Laguna, who was Franz Boas's last PhD student. Um, Freddie was an interesting character. She had a very formal notion of her relationship to students. I got to know a very different person after I graduated than, than the one who was in the class. Um, and I did stay in reasonably close touch with her until her death at 97 or 98. I always forget which it was. But anyway, she um, continued to work, got a, an enormous amount of work published after her retirement, which was almost as long as her formal career. So I began knowing a great deal about the Northwest Coast and Native Americans just because those were the examples. My favorite memory of that first year class was Freddie was going, there were 40 of us in the class and they apologized that it was so large. And she was talking about the kinship system, the eight class kinship system of the central Arunta. That one marries three, marries five, whose children are, and so on. And one by one, the 40 of us put down our pens and <laughs> stopped listening. <laughs> After a while, she blinked nearsightedly at us over her glasses, took off her glasses, and began to tell us stories about, I think, at fishing villages and ladies that she had worked with. And at this point, I'm thinking, I think I'd like that. This woman who is clearly so awkward with people, or at least with students, in her academic persona, 
is so clearly a different person when she talks about the community-based work that she has done. And I think it was that image more than anything else that said, okay, I want to do this. It was a very small department. There were 11 majors, as I recall. It was supposed to be a joint sociology and anthropology department, but it wasn't because Freddie and the sociologists didn't get along. And so none of us ever took a sociology course. Um, I don't think I even ever spoke to this fellow. I can remember his face, but not his name, who um, was the sociologist. And the only way they could make it work was to hire, they had a, a different rotating position in one or two year stretches. So they'd bring someone in for one or two years who would teach whatever they wanted to teach, basically, uh, for at least one course. So it meant that you had a, a fair exposure to most of the subdisciplines. Linguistics was really not in anthropology at that point. I took American Archaeology from Freddie. Um, used to be very good at rattling off the the series of um, of different kinds of arrowheads at St. Lawrence Island, but okay. One picks up interesting facts. Jane Goodale taught a course in in supposedly physical anthropology, but it was primatology. That one was you went to the Philadelphia Zoo and observed a primate for an hour. I found that really interesting because when you try to do it, you have to decide how, how person-like you're going to make your description of the behavior. And that's an issue of, of cross-species relationships that I still worry about in one way or the other in my work. Um, one, of the, one of the courses that they brought in one year was Anthropology in the Classics. That was fun. And let's see what else. Then my fourth year, last year, um, we had a course taught by A. Irving Hallowell. Pete, he didn't like being called Dr. Hallowell. It made him feel old. So he became a kind of grandfather figure, um, as I would put it, having done field work later with Native Americans, and a very dear friend who stayed a friend for the rest of his life. Um, Pete was supposedly teaching history of anthropology. We made it almost through the Middle Ages in the first semester. And in the second semester, the last lecture was on how Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown would be along any day now, which I don't think very many places can do that kind of an intellectual history course anymore. And that was really kind of neat. The first course, that, the first class that Pete taught, it was a wonderful September day, and the department seminar room was in the library, which was built around a cloister. So it's not the library anymore, but the cloister is still there. So we told him that classes always met outside when the weather was nice. And he was worried that someone would get mad at him if we did that, but we persuaded him it was okay. So all 10 or 11 of us migrated out to the lawn. And somebody dragged a chair from the seminar room out to the lawn for Pete, who had retired at 70 from Penn at that point. And he was crushed that we expected him to sit on a chair while the rest of us sprawled about on the grass. And so he sat down cross-legged, something he clearly learned in the Barrens River District of Northern Ontario, and did not squirm for the two hours of the class he taught us. I've always remembered that ability to be still because I don't have it in that kind of way at all. That was kind of fun. The other one that I remember with pleasure from that undergraduate education, they made us, can you imagine, they made us take a science course. I can't draw and I couldn't do, I couldn't hack the idea of dissection, so biology was out. Um, never took physics in high school. Chemistry was a disaster. I almost failed high school chemistry because I was making 
s'mores on the Bunsen burner and got caught at it. It was boring. Anyway, so I took geology with the rest of the English majors. They were very kind to the people who took it as their science requirement. It was a very serious department for the two or three majors a year that went on in geology. But it was kind of, okay, you play fair with us, you will pass decently. Um, sort of enterprise for the requirement. That was me, of course. But what I remember is that the instructor in the last lecture of structural geology came in and said, I want to tell you about something that is not in the syllabus or the textbook, but I think that it's going to be important in the next, um, in the next few years, in the next couple of decades, perhaps. And what he told us about that day with no notes was plate tectonics. This was 1962-3, I think second year, yes, Six, 62, 63. And I have checked with geologists since. That was indeed something that you wouldn't expect to find in an undergraduate course where most of the people were English majors or, or some equivalent. Um, and I've always remembered it as a kind of science is not something that has closure and, and tidiness. It's something that becomes much more complicated very quickly. Um, I never worried much about marks at Bryn Mawr. It, it seemed to me going in, hey, I got in. I get to hang out with these people for four years. This is going to be so good. And it was. But I did it in a kind of cherry picking, finding people to talk to. I audited a number of courses, um, including the classical archaeology and art history things, which were, were world-class departments. I hate that word, but, but very well known in their fields. And Bryn Mawr always had their senior faculty, the people whose names you'd heard of, teaching the introductory courses. You simply didn't teach there if you didn't want to do that. And so those were really kind of, of cool experiences, too. I figured I couldn't major in either of those because they always met at 9 o'clock in the morning and had these slides where the lights would go out and I would promptly go to sleep. Being a night owl in those days too, that wasn't good. You need to be able to see the slides. Um, but I did get a lot out of those. Another thing that I think most colleges, and of course it's college in the American sense, not the, the Canadian, um, was that they had four courses which were ex literature in translation. I took two of them for credit and audited the other two. One was on the Bible in translation. One was on classics in translation, which was taught by Richmond Latimer, whose translation of, of Heshed's Work of Days came out while I was there. <laughs> he was a poet in his own right. Wonderful, wonderful experience. I didn't take that for credit because I couldn't work it in, but I did audit it one year. And then I took Russian literature in translation, having been a Dostoevsky fan since early high school. Um, still think Dostoevsky was the best of them, but it gave it a much broader cultural background. The instructor was a Dutch woman who liked Tolstoy much better than Dostoevsky. I think we could say that we were at odds for most of the course, but that was okay. I didn't do terribly well, but I passed it respectably. Um, then there was Dante in translation. There were three of us. The other two were art history majors who needed Italian and really didn't want to be there. But there we were doing the literature in translation. It was taught by a wonderful little old lady who was somewhere under five feet and almost as wide and about ready to retire. Her name was Miss Angeline Lagrasso. Miss Lagrasso would read it to us in Italian, particularly, and then we had one of those translations where the Italian was on one side and the English on the other, which I adored because you could piece it out. And I did four years of Latin because that was the only language you could take four years of when I was in high school. 
So I knew how to do that kind of, of stuff. Anyway, she would read it to us in Italian, and then she'd bang her fist on the table and, and scream at us, don't you see, it's beautiful. And I thought, OK, I'm not going to drop this course. It's ridiculous, but I'm not going to drop it. It was a half course over a full year. The others were full year courses. So that's another one I remember with, with delight, I think. It was just a lovely place to think about things and do things. Then when graduation came around, I realized that I was about a quarter of a point from graduating magna cum laude, and the idea had never occurred to me. Um, weird. I just, and I got, oh, oh sorry, I, I missed. I did a double major because I still like to read books. So English literature and anthropology. And I think my dad still thought I was going to be a high school English teacher when I grew up. And the, I got at least 10 points higher marks in the anthropology courses than in the English courses, because in those days, English was text only based. And I kept writing social science kinds of papers for my um, English courses didn't go over well, so my specialization in English was medieval English, uh, which is, again, a cultural construct, and I'm still fascinated by the Middle Ages and its world. And then, as I think as an intellectual historian, about the transition from the Middle Ages to, to something that is more recognizable as our tradition, uh, it's very useful to have that kind of baseline. So all of these crazy things that I played with as an undergraduate, I think, made me the kind of, of intellectual that I am. It was fun. Above all else, it was fun. You could wander in and talk to any professor about anything, and if they'd never seen you before, that wasn't the problem. You sort of, hi, I'm so-and-so. I understand you work on this, and I was thinking about blah, blah. And they would say, OK, and talk to you. Um, so I've always kind of had this um, assumption that people should be open to talking to different kinds of interest about what they do. And that was nice, too. Then senior year, I had to think about what to do next. And I thought, which kind of people do I want to spend the rest of my life talking to? And I looked at my fellow English majors who seemed to be increasingly reading literary criticism instead of books. I never read literary criticism and was occasionally accused of plagiarism. And they said, I, I never heard of that author or that book. I read the book that was assigned for the class. I liked it. This is what I think about it. Apparently, critics thought some of the same things I thought sometimes, which was nice to know in its way. Um, so I decided I'd rather talk to the anthropologists for the rest of my life. I applied to two places, the University of Pennsylvania, because I was settled in Philadelphia at that point, and Bryn Mawr just in case. Freddie, I think, was quite disappointed when I chose not to go to Bryn Mawr. Um, there was a very small graduate program. They had just a few, taught completely on overload, which I wouldn't have noticed then, but I do now, of course. Um, and they don't anymore. Bryn Mawr, a number of years after I left, decided that they would have only a couple of departments in which they would continue to offer graduate work. I thought that was a terrible idea because it seemed to me that, that I could see myself becoming an academic and wanting to teach at a small place with very good students that would be interesting to talk to. But I would also not want to give up the academy's promise of being able to train people to go on doing the kind of work that you do. And that would seem to require, if not a robust graduate program, at least the possibility of a graduate pro program or of some students. And that, obviously, they felt they could not continue to support in this kind of random sort of way. I personally think that, that the retention rate for faculty with very good research reputations who could have gone elsewhere would have been less had they not had that option of having the occasional PhD student. As for example, Freddie had Hiroko Sue from Japan working on Northwest Coast stuff. Freddie was the person for her to work with.
that was the proper thing to do. Um, and I think that it was an error in that sense. Many years later at the American Philosophical Society, I was talking to Mary Marples Dunn, who was from the who was in the history department at Bryn Mawr then, and went on to become a, um, a college president and many other things. She was then executive director of the APS. And Mary said, oh no, it was awful. There was no reason for us to be teaching second or third rate graduate students in history. And I, that wasn't my understanding of it. And it seemed to me it was something that would have worked in a different way, as it did for a department as small as anthropology to start with. However, um, obviously that went as it did. I've been back to Bryn Mawr recently, and it's, it's a very different place than it was when I was there. Um, they've done a wonderful job of attracting students of very different backgrounds, ethnicities, races. If you think the term race means anything at all, it's, uh, it's an interesting campus, but it doesn't have much anymore that, that reminds me of what it was when I was there. So I go back and look at the place, but there's not much. Obviously, all of the faculty that taught me are, are long gone. There was still a 65 retirement age when I graduated, so a um, different place. It still certainly has the aspirations to teach women and to have them expect to be treated as persons 